Welcome back to Pet Sitter Confessional. Today, we're brought to you by Time to Pet and Pet Perennials. How do you get better over time? Taylor Liedahl, owner of Tiny Horse, joins the show to describe how to approach process improvement and how we can develop healthier relationships with our business. She shares her process of developing and approaching new products and the importance of understanding our customer needs while we maintain and prevent mission creep from taking over our business. Let's get started. Colin, I'm so excited to be back on your show. Thank you for uh, inviting me again. I'm so excited to be here because uh, Tommy Horse is entering new frontiers. So thanks for celebrating that with me. Um, so my name is Taylor Leadall. I started walking dogs professionally in Toronto in 2016. And uh, quickly into that work, I realized that it was very physically and emotionally demanding. And I felt that part of that challenge was uh, due to insufficient gear for walking multiple dogs. And that sent me on a Google search to try and find a suitable alternative. And it didn't yield any results that um, that I thought were were suitable. So I have a background in sewing and design, and I decided to try and solve the problem myself. I started developing some ideas and some prototypes, and my friend Sarah Wheatman joined in. And uh, shortly thereafter, we had the first prototype of the lead-all leash. And I started testing that, and it quickly caught the attention of my fellow dog walkers and saw that there was a desire and a need for this. And uh, in the end of May 2017, we launched the very first version of the Lead All Leash. It was 21 inches long. It had a clip on both ends. And it was made of thin polypropylene webbing. Um, And since that time, our product line has improved and expanded uh, upon that first product, and uh, in twenty, so so from twenty seventeen to twenty twenty one, I continued to walk dogs and run Tiny Horse. And in July twenty twenty one, I got to step away from dog walking and pursue Tiny Horse full time. Quite the journey that you've been on there. Uh, <laughs> it's been, it's been, it's yeah. been a lot. And, and I noticed when you mentioned that this is a very physically and demanding job and career, I, I think a lot of people may understand how having good gear helps us physically to avoid injury and such. How, how do you see your your equipment, the tools that you make, how do you see that impacting the emotional side of, of running a business? Right. So I think that, you know, I'm trying to design this gear to be very intuitive and almost as if you don't have to think about it, um, that the things that you need are right at hand and you're not having to um, struggle so much to um, reconfigure or um, take the pressure of all the dogs at one time on your hand um, sorry, no, that's not quite, <laughs> quite, let me come back on that. Um, yeah, so yeah, I, tiny horse gear is meant to be really intuitive and, and I'm trying to design it in ways that you don't have to think about your gear so much. So, you know, for example, I have this wearable leash, the leader, which I say you can wear all day and you put it on in the morning and you use it for your pickup and drop off tool. You never have to search your vehicle for a leash. It's just right there on your body um, in terms of the lead all leash that you attach to the dogs. They're adjustable. Um, you can clip them on and off the ring. You can secure them to your vehicle. So you always have what you need at hand. And um, I think not having to put the energy in trying to solve those problems, and you have to solve them constantly when you're walking dogs, um, that that can free up a lot of space for you to connect with your dogs, um, work with clients, and just kind of be more present and aware uh, during your day. 
Yeah, if you're not having to constantly think about where's this, basically that mental burden that really plays into our day of, is this the right thing? Is this going to work? Where is this? Do I have enough? How many do I need? Is this in good condition? All of those are kind of these 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 micro uh, uh, fatigues that happen on us throughout the entire day. And that's just kind of, that's a baseline that many of us deal with of that we don't even really acknowledge as being a stressor on us, but they are. And they, they really do add up over time to the point where we get to that point where we go, there's just one more thing and I can't take this one more thing. And so anything we can do to try and reduce that mental load that we carry throughout the day, that's why I know a lot of people they wear the same thing every day or they have their work uniform just to be like, I never have to guess what I'm wearing, right? That's one less decision I have to make today. And so having good tools on you really does help improve that as well because you, there's no thought. You, you absolutely know for sure what it is and how it's going to work. Exactly. Yes. And that's such a great term, micro fatigue. And that's exactly what it is. And I've always sort of built the gear as like a stress reducer. Um, so... It, it, yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's just one less thing to think about in your day. And uh, I, I think that that just can help bring energy back into both your working life and your personal life. And uh, and being well and present in your personal life has always been an important part of Tiny Horse to me as well. Um, if your body is sore and you're fatigued at the end of the day, you can't really show up for the other part of your life, which really, you know, I hope everyone feels is more important to be there with your family, to be there for yourself, for your hobbies, just for your general self-care and well-being. You mentioned how your your product line has grown and expanded. And I, I've noticed actually that you have quite a few uh, pro products now. And so I did want to ask you about the development of those and, and where you see those fitting in the, the lineup and your overall products. Hey, I love this question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I've always been really excited and open to the possibility of what Tiny Horse can become, um, how it both reflects the dog walking industry and can be improved by the dog walking industry. And then how Tiny Horse can help improve the dog walking industry in return. So I think at its best, Tiny Horse opens a kind of like feedback loop between itself and the dog walking industry. Um, so, and part of that is how this pro line started. Uh, there was a dog walker named Tamara Stanley in Carnation, Washington. And she reached out to me and said that I love the design of your products, um, but you know, I have to deal with a salmon run out here. And no matter how much I wash those nylon leashes, the smell of dead salmon just does not come out. Oh. I never thought about making this in biothane. Mm. And so she put that in my ear. And of course, I was seeing the growing popularity of that material in the industry and started to look into that. And, and, Tamara even suggested that I use the term pro to designate those products. So, I mean, big thumbs up to Tamara for uh, bringing her ideas to Tiny Horse about how we could improve the products. Um, so, yeah, I started looking at bringing biothane in. Um, it's got that waterproof capacity. It's quite durable, beautiful colors. The um, The colors kind of stay vibrant throughout its life. And uh, so integrating biothane meant a major upgrade in machinery and the expensive new materials. So it did take me a little while. I um, To sew biothane is not an easy thing. And yeah, it does require quite a much more intense sewing machine than I had at the time. Um, yeah. So the pro line started with that. And, you know, there's a lot of durability in our nylon products. But uh, as the years go on, I am getting feedback from dog walkers who've been using, you know, specific products like the nylon leader for a couple of years now. And I am seeing some consistency in the wear and tear on those products that I think I can solve um, with the pro line. So overall, I don't get you know, I, I don't have like a rash of people saying this is breaking or blah, blah, blah. But I'm, I'm seeing some consistent things that, um, you know, people report to me every once in a while. And uh, so I think with the developing the pro uh, 
developing, sorry, developing the pro line of our current products, we're going to be seeing, um, we have the Lead All Pro, which is the leash. I've introduced the Handler Pro, which is the short traffic lead that has clips at both ends. And uh, we have the leader nylon only right now, but pretty soon I'm going to be introducing a biothane version of that being the leader pro and both the handler pro and the leader pro will have uh, stainless steel clips on them. So uh, I think with this, with the stainless steel clips, we're going to have quite a bit of a longer life for these products. Uh, the the clips right now on the nylon leader, again, they're working in most cases, but when you're sticking, uh, clipping the nylon leader to a central ring that has like six to eight dogs that are pulling really hard and, you know, not a lot of dog, sorry, not, not all dog walkers um, have a group that pulls really intensely or are really wild, but for the ones that do, that stresses the gear a lot more. Um, and I think in those specific instances, having a stainless steel clip is going to prevent some of the consistent wear and tear I see on those leaders in the long term. Does that make sense? It, it, <laughs> no, it, it it does because you know thinking of right now, going okay. Well, you shipped your first product in 2017. Really, is when you you started this, and so we're kind of coming up on six years of this, and that. So I'm I'm sure you're still getting some new data on just the longevity of these products. I think that's a very interesting problem to try and solve. Of well, I'm going to make this thing, and I think it's going to last a long time. But a I don't really know. And then B, I don't have any control of how people are or are not going to use this product and what conditions it's going to be in. You know, like the salmon run, like that was definitely, I'm sure, not something that was on your list of problems people will encounter. Stinky salmon, right? That, was, <laughs> that wasn't part of that. And so that's where that feedback really comes into play of going, I'm going to make something. I'm not sure how it's going to pan out, but in order for me to kind of stay ahead of that, I need that feedback loop in that process to make sure that I'm always improving this just little by little. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think too, now that I have some data and I have some ideas about how to solve some of those consistent issues that are coming back to the company, I'm really excited that I'll be able to offer like a longer warranty on the pro line mm -hmm. right now, the one year warranty on parts on our products. But, you know, I'm not sure what the next warranty will be, but it will be significantly greater than that. And uh, I'm very passionate about uh, Tiny Horse being part of reducing the waste load of the dog walking industry. Uh, very much interested in sort of greening this industry as much as we can. And I'd much rather be selling really fantastic products that last a long time and people talk about than producing something that's cheap and disposable um, with a higher margin. So I'm really just about, you know, how can we keep this gear in play as long as possible? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Did you ever think about just going all in with the biothane and getting rid of the of the nylons or was it important for you to have different options for people in their use cases that's a really great question as well um you know i would love to just toss out the nylon for sure and make my life a lot more simple it's a lot of work <laughs> to keep i've got 20 colors of nylon and i think 26 colors of biothane it's a lot of work to keep those materials always available to uh customers and it's expensive as well um but you know i'm i'm very sensitive to the fact that um tiny horse gear and just being equipped for dog walking in general can be an expensive thing and I'm able to offer the nylon version of the design, which does all the same things basically as the Biothane Pro version um, at quite a bit lower of a price point. And I don't want people to feel or be excluded from better working conditions based on a financial thing. Of course, I have to charge something for right. um, the gear. But I really feel passionate about making it financially accessible as well. And that's something that I can do with the nylon. So I will always keep something 
that um, has a low entry point for people. And, you know, I do see a lot of people too who start out on the nylon leashes, not just because it's a financial thing, but because they're not sure whether or not they're going to like the product and they don't want to make a, a big investment right to, at the start. And then those people who do enjoy the gear oftentimes upgrade to the biothane version, to the pro version, and either give the sets to a fellow dog walker or to a new employee in their business if their business is growing. Yeah, and really allowing the the, the customers to kind of self-select into what they're prioritizing and what their needs are. And we do that in the service industry as well. Like we can have a whole menu full of options of kind of services that we think people may want, whether that's length of visits, whether that's involvement or uh, uh, you know, the, the the kind of things we do in a visit, we may just come over and, and do a walk or we can say, oh, if you want us to, we can also do medications and feeding or, or whatever we're doing there. And then that gives us a lot of data too, just as the business owner to go, where are people falling out on this? Where are the, the price sensitivities coming in versus the utility that people see? And then you can really kind of self-select and adjust as need be. You know, maybe you don't have to keep 20 different colors on hand. You just offer that one in a, in a small handful or less to make it a little bit easier on you, but still have that there. And then you can really ad- adapt as you start to get that feedback again of people telling you what they want through either directly in their reviews or through their dollar as they're purchasing things. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, <laughs> I would like to downsize the number of nylon colors that I have, but it's so hard to choose because they're all so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> And they combine in just such beautiful ways. I'm, I'm definitely a color addict, so it hurts my heart to think about taking any color out of the the product lineup. Oh, I can't, I can't, I can't even imagine uh, of just knowing how to how to self select out, out out of that. You know, you mentioned that you know this is a different way of of, of operating for people, and then sometimes they need um, they're not sure of what's going to work for them or how it makes. Uh, they're gonna their life easier and and I, I was thinking about this of of what convinces people to to purchase something and we encounter that a lot in the service industry again of just we know how awesome our services are we know the peace of mind it gives people we it's we, all the professionalism and things that we bring in but sometimes it seems like we're just hollering on the other side of the riverbank and people don't cross to come talk to us because we can't they they have to experience it to really understand what we're offering. So for for you when you're offering products, what do you think is that process in your in your client's mind of what convinces them eventually to to try and make that purchase? Well, I suppose that's a million dollar question. Right. <laughs> I, so just you know, solve that for us, Taylor, please. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the answer for. Um, but I I think that I know what often brings people to Tiny Horse, and I think it was similar to my own experience, which is they have a frustration with dog handling. And so they either do a Google search and come across tiny horse, or they see a fellow dog walker or dog owner who's really excelling at handling their groups using tiny horse gear. So I think in part, the what convinces people to buy this product is when they stumble upon tiny horse gear, they see people excelling with it. Um, so, so that's one thing. Um, I I think everybody (laughs) is just hitting the buy button with a lot of hope in their heart. (laughs) Uh, You know, I, I hope that, you know, we can provide what they're, they're looking for, but I do know that the answer to people's issues is not always entirely, um, a gear issue or sorry, I think that when people, they come with their frustration, it's not just a frustration with gear, but also, you know, some training needs to happen or there might be some change in their business model that might need to happen. So, yeah. Yeah, that that's huge is recognizing that when people come to us, it's it's very rarely a specific issue. It's multifaceted. And on the receiving end of that, trying to parse through what they're telling you or what their needs are to figure out exactly what they're trying to solve. Because like you said, it could be that they actually have 
three dogs that don't need to be in that group walk that day. They, they actually need to be removed and those clients need to be fired. But instead, they keep trying to solve it using gear or new things or different different tactics when that's not actually getting to the root of the problem. And that's that's not on on us, really, as as the business owners, as the service providers to try and meet those needs. It's the same thing with clients. They may reach out to us and say, I need you to watch my dogs. We think the problem they're trying to solve is peace of mind. But the problem that they actually have is they need to go see grandma before her funeral. And we, we're cross-talking at those different points and just realizing we have our scope and it's okay to not get outside of that and just continue to stay focused on the things that we can do for the problems that we know exist for people. Yes, exactly. And I think that the best that I can do in that situation is to remind people that tiny horse care is not magical, that there are a number of things that you need to consider. And I try to um, bring people's attention to or provide resources. Have you heard of Time to Pet? Doug from Bad to the Bone Pet Care has this to say. Time to Pet has made managing my team and clients so much easier. Our clients love the easy-to-use app and scheduling features, and our sitters love being able to have all of their information organized and easily accessible. My favorite feature is the instant messaging. By keeping conversations on Time to Pet, we are able to monitor our team and ensure nothing ever falls through the cracks. If you're looking for new pet sitting software, give Time to Pet a try. Listeners of our show, save 50% off your first three months by visiting timetopet.com slash confessional. Well, and so it gets into an, another question about about messaging and information out there that that you that you give to people. I, I've seen you putting together a lot of how to videos and showing the, the the off the the systems. Why do you feel like that's important for people? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you know, first of all, I think the thing that's really been consistent for me about developing my the messaging around my business is I have never told anyone that they should buy tiny horse products. I completely avoid words like should and need in the marketing. Mm. Um, I want people to enter tiny horse with a feeling of an opening of possibility about themselves, their relationship with their dogs in their care and their business. I don't want to feel like when they enter the tiny horse world, it closes around them and they need to use it. They need to understand it. You know, I just really want to, um, I want tiny horse to be an, an opening platform. And I mean, aside from avoiding words like need and should for that reason, I also just don't believe in that kind of marketing in the world. I think it's really destructive and concerning, uh, when you place uh, words like need and should on uh, material things that are not basic human needs. Um, so I, in terms of the videos and how to's in, and also, you know, not trying to um, convince people to buy my product is that I want them to see the how to videos and to arrive at Tiny Horse from a place of a bit of knowledge about the gear. Um, to start to think creatively about what the gear can do and its versatility. I also get a lot of the same questions from uh, people who are either already have Tiny Horse gear in their hands or are looking to purchase some. And I find it's really helpful to have uh, a visual demonstration of that information, just sort of at a, a quick link for them. So it's both really great for me in terms of people discovering Tiny Horse products um, with a taste of what they can do, and also um, a way for me to converse with people about the products. I think that for people who already have tiny horse gear, I see their ownership of that gear as an investment and one that can increase in value as I'm able to create and provide more information about that gear and also create products that will link into things that they already own. Um, so, you know, just this is a bit of an aside, but one thing that really makes me excited is uh, in some of the Facebook dog walking groups that I'm in, sometimes I see people who are leaving the dog walking industry and they're selling their tiny horse set and they are getting a lot of money 
um, for youth sets. And that's so exciting to me. It shows me that there is a lot of value on the gear and there is um, a lot of um, that, the, that the gear stands, the quality stands out and you can use those products and uh, they might even outlast your own career, which is just, yeah, really exciting for me. And it doesn't bother me at all that people sell used tiny horse gear. I've even shared um, people's posts about wanting to sell it again. I just want to keep that gear in play and out of the waste, uh, uh, out of the waste as much as possible. Mm. Well, it's, it's, have you ever thought about having a, or running a refurbished store out of for Tiny Horse? If people, you know, return them, you give them a little bit money back, and then you can resell those after you, uh, you know, f- fix them up or re- or patch them up, and then put them back out on the market. Or are you kind of happy with how this this other market is existing on the other side? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd much rather people will deal with that on their own, um, <laughs> and because I have a lot of things to do. Oh, uh, what? That's crazy. <laughs> Um, and you know, it's really exciting. We get so few returns on the year. Um, I, you know, like last year, I can each year count on my 10 fingers, how many returns we get. Um, and for the, the few that have come back in, I do have a bin that they're going into. And I, one time at one point in the future, hope to have like a tiny horse garage sale. (laughs) (laughs) Or and just do like, you know, sort of local thing you can pick through here and and uh, get either some of these returned items or things that, you know, the stitching was a little off or the tag was a little crooked. And uh, yeah, people can get those at a reduced value. Just jumping back to the how why you think the videos and the how tos are so important, and and I, I really appreciate how you you talked about you want people to arrive with an open mind about open possibilities. That that knowledge really does allow them to start seeing and thinking. How can this be beneficial to me? Because mm-hmm. the more they know about a service or the more they know about a product, the, the more they're going to know whether it's it's for them or not. And so that's that's really our role of doing this big educational, this big how-to, this big, you know, not really talking about our services or our products directly in some cases, but saying, hey, I want to show you something cool that you can do with XYZ and putting something together because that does allow them to start thinking of those possibilities in their own life. And and I kind of <laughs> I kind of think of it how but if you go into like a house buying process, a lot of times the the realtors will start using like your language or our language to start trying to get you to think about like what would it envision my life in this home or how would that fit me? Is this a good fit? Could I see myself using this? And that's where those processes of where they're going to convince themselves whether that's a good buy or not. And really it's nothing that we can do to force people. You said that Taylor of like should need to must like those language of forcing people into that situation, because we know like that's not going to be very satisfying to us to know we strong armed somebody into us versus them gladly coming and going, I want you to solve my problem. Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. that. <laughs> and, well, and, and so you, one of the big changes that you made pretty pretty recently, Taylor, was actually you decided to open a a, a brick and mortar store. What 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 was the thinking behind that? <laughs> okay, well, I guess there's a few things. Um, the sort of precursor to that that I didn't know that a brick and mortar store was coming was that um, at the end of 2021. Uh, I had an incredibly successful Black Friday sale that wrapped up a really exciting growth year. I think our sales uh, grew by 150% in 2021. And uh, I was working completely by myself on the business. And I was packing those Black Friday orders. And I just had this moment where that I realized I can't do this alone anymore. I simply not. And I started thinking about the possibility of having an employee. And I found that perfect employee. My friend, Teresa Hayes, came on part-time. 
She's actually the wife of Sarah, who uh, co-founded Tiny Horse with me back in 2017. Oh, wow. (laughs) Yeah, we really sort of kept it in the quote-unquote family. We're not actually family, but uh, we have very close connections. We're all from Saskatchewan. Um, We live in the same house. I'm on the main floor. They're upstairs. So um, Teresa came on in early February 2022. Um, She was in her retirement. She was a medical doctor, just as Sarah was as well. And Teresa was really just looking for something to excite and challenge her. Um, And I'm so grateful that she made herself available to Tiny Horse because she has such an incredible skill set. She, um, aside from um, having a medical career before that, she did a degree in theater costume design. She's an incredible seamstress. Like she's the person who can make those like 18th century Victorian dresses. I don't know, like just, <laughs> just, just so incredible. Wow. Um, you know, she has a, a wide skill set of construction skills and just just phenomenal. So she came on and very quickly started improving our workshop, a lot of the processes, and took over most of the production. Um, so she got us to the point where we actually had stock of products. Before that, I was making products as the orders came in. So she basically allowed me to spend a bit more time developing the non-production aspects of the business. And um, so, and then also in that year, because we had this extra stock, I decided that we could take on some trade shows for the very first time Mm. and have an in-person Uh, shopping experience. And so we tested a few small uh, events in the summertime and those were great learning curves. I think the first one we set up for took us about two hours to set up. We were setting up one hour into when the event already started and maybe just sold like $90 worth of equipment. Like it was pretty fun. Oh, so we learned so much and it was totally fine. Like we kind of knew it was going to be a learning experience and it really, truly was. And uh, so learned from that and um, made some changes. And then by the fall, we started doing the really big um, Canadian pet expo shows. And we were blown away with the response. There were lineups to get into our booth and talk to us. Um, totally smashed what we thought in terms of what the sales would be. Um, so yeah, we did two pet expos in Toronto and then one in Ottawa. And the experience of those pet expo, ex- the experience of those pet expos was so incredible. Um, to be able to speak to customers directly while they have their dogs, giving them the opportunity to try the leashes and walk around and come back was so exhilarating. Like Mm. (laughs) seeing someone um, put their two or three dogs on these leashes and just go for a little stroll and exclaim, oh my God, this is amazing, (laughs) Um, was just, you know, totally filled my heart. And, uh, and I also got to meet a lot of people that I had been talking to on Instagram who came out to the show. So just having those in-person customer experiences were really valuable. And I think that that definitely started the seed of, okay, we need a place for this to occur regularly. Um, and then, you know, I was, it was, (laughs) it's happened so fast. It was Fall of last year, there was a a dog supply store in my neighborhood that was closing down. And for some reason, the closing down of that pet store made me feel like I should open one. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, I can't really quite get the logic around that. But basically that day I started seeing what was available in my neighborhood. 
and I viewed some places and that just really started the excitement. And um, alone, I wasn't able to see a lot of places, but I started to work with a realtor. It was fantastic, Anil, and he just brought a, quite a few different listings to me. And, you know, within a few weeks, we found our sweet spot. And fortunately, the landlord was interested in having us. And I was signing a lease two weeks later. And we took possession of the place on January 1st. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. We were three months. And then all of a sudden, we had a brick and mortar store. So, so yeah. So, we opened it up. Uh, because there was new potential with having Teresa at hand um, that allowed me to do other things with the business. And and then also, honestly, I've been running Tiny Horse out of my one bedroom Toronto home <laughs> for oh. six years now. And Tiny Horse had been in every single room in that house outside of the kitchen and the bathroom, um, just trying to moved around for my own sanity and to find like bigger and bigger spaces where that could accommodate more equipment, more materials. So having more space for a tiny horse to grow and also give me a personal space Mm. has been really important. Um, it It was so strange when we moved everything tiny horse related out of my apartment There was basically nothing left except for a bed, a couch, (laughs) some book, um, a keyboard. And I was just like, wow, it really showed me how much Tiny Horse was my life. And it was really strange those first few weeks to just come home and settle down um, and have not even a desktop computer (laughs) to do work on. I was just completely left to you know tailor personal life uh no tiny horse allowed so i've been taking weekends off i've been really trying to take advantage of that space and um take some real rest and then be more productive in the hours that are dedicated to tiny horse here at the store Mm. I was I was going to ask about that because that is a very that I mean that is a physical manifestation of of how all consuming the business is whenever it's around you twenty four seven. You know, oh. earlier we talked about removing micro these fatigue. <laughs> yeah, these micro fatigues, but this was like this was a lot more than than that. I'm sure of just like constantly being reminded, not in you know not in a bad way, but just like it was omnipresent. In your mm-hmm. life, so I'm sure that the did you said a couple you know it was an adjustment period, but but how did you start processing that of like really come to terms of like it's empty, but it's a good thing because it's over somewhere else? Yeah, I think it definitely just was. I decided to accept it and allow myself to feel a little bit awkward and feel myself, um, you know, see my apartment return to a place that it was in 2017 when everything came in there and and I was like, am I still this person? Do I still like these topics of these books? Do I still want to play piano? Do I, you know? So I just sort of allowed myself to um, experience that. um, Yeah. That awkwardness and uh, just, Breathe and lie on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know many pet sitters experience this same thing when they offer, if they offer boarding or or daycare out of their home, and the pets, it's just they they never get away from from the pet care side. It's always there, and the first time that they get a break or if they stop it, it can feel feel really weird. That emptiness, that space that was filled with this other stuff, all of a sudden, it's like, well, what do I? What do I do at that time? And and really going, it's okay to not fill it immediately back up with stuff. Like I'm sure you didn't return a lot of the stock just to feel more comfortable back into your your, your home. Like it's... <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, exactly. You know, and in terms of um, not feeling the pressure to fill the space, I feel the same thing with uh, coming into the store. Um, there's so much more space here. Mm-hmm. Um and I'm trying to let myself um, let it be a process and not try to um, anticipate everything we're going to need for our entire life in here. 
but let there be space in the way the products are displayed. You know, I've got a main floor, we've got the basement. Um, so there's a lot more space and I'm trying to have the same kind of acceptance and patience and process with that. Our friends at Pet Perennial will make it easy to send a heartfelt condolence gift directly to someone with a broken heart. Seriously, this is something you can do from your phone. They have this awesome direct-to-consumer gift model that takes the effort off of us and ensures a thoughtful, personalized sympathy gift reaches your client or employee from your behalf. All gift packages include a handwritten card, colorful gift wrap, and shipping fees across the U.S. and Canada. They also offer an array of milestone gifts and greeting cards that can be sent to celebrate birthdays, extend get-well wishes, and welcome new or rescued pets. They also have gift choices in case you need to send a sympathy gift in memory of a special human client or celebrate a pregnancy, engagement, or wedding of a pet lover. If you're interested, register for a free business gift perks account to unlock the all-inclusive discounted package prices. Since the service is used on an as-need basis, there is no monthly or annual obligations or minimum purchase. Learn more by visiting petperennials.com and sign up using a link in the show notes of this episode. Well, that gets into a question I had for you about about mission creep, because with making products, I'm sure that there's just a thousand different things that you could make or pro- problems you could try and solve. And so how, how do you make sure that your product line and the mission of, of Tiny Horse stays, stays focused on, on what you're trying to accomplish? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think a lot of that mission creep um, or the danger of it, if you want to say it's a danger, comes from um, potential customers or customers um, wanting certain things uh, or asking you for products that you don't have. For example, I don't know how many times a week people ask me if we are... Uh, if we have collars or are going to start making collars or harnesses. And there certainly was a time when I thought, okay, like we'll get there, we'll do collars, we'll do harnesses. But honestly, I'm not sure we ever really will. Um, it's, it's not a far leap from what we're doing now, but there, there's just so much yet to explore with our current product line and to get the message out there around multi-dog handling. Mm -hmm. Um, So you only have so many hours in a day and I, trust me, I'm a very, I get very distracted by the idea of designing new things. I have so I have a, I won't say a graveyard, but I have like a, a treasure chest of, things that I've designed and could be tiny horse products. Um, I have a number of products that are slated to be released at one point um, that are related to walking multiple dogs. It's a very easy thing to pour energy into because it's creative and exciting and it's fun. But when I spend too much time on designing and thinking about new products, whether or not they're part of our original mission, it takes away from my ability to develop the messaging around our current products and ideas and also doing things like uh, sorting out receipts and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the nitty gritty day to day stuff that really has to get done. Um, so just trying to stay focused on our mission and doing justice to what we are currently offering, I think that helps prevent the mission creep. Mm. It, it, it does when you recognize that there's still so much work to do, as you said, like there's so much education that still needs to get done and, and probably will, will never be fully, uh, uh accomplished in, in just cause I'll, every day there's somebody new to, to multi-dog ownership or everybody, there's somebody new who's new to multi-dog walking. And there's, there's that mission that has to continue moving forward. But I also know that there's this there's this other side of going, well, I still, so I still need to know and, and adapt and, and, and change. And many people I, I know get, get locked up in how they, they, they walk that line between staying true to my mission, but open to adapting and changing. And I think part of that really bridging that gap is 
is that feedback and, and, and response and communication you have with your existing clients and potential customers who are coming in to see if you are still meeting the need and where it's going? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, those, I think maybe we talked about this last time, but you get a lot of feedback and suggestions from people and you kind of have to filter through what is going to be relevant to the company and what is not. I mean, it's all relevant knowing that, you know, people want callers. Okay. I, it's in my mind that won't go away, but knowing also that I get multiple requests a week about people wanting a biothane version of the leader. um, That one is more exciting to me. Um, and falls in line with our current mission about the product designs that we have and where I want to take the um, product line itself. So it it also gives me some confidence that, okay, I mean, investing in the materials that will be part of that product, the lot, there's a lot of length of biothane in that the stainless steel clips are significantly more expensive than what is on the, the nylon leader. Now um, it makes me more confident that that investment that I will be put in will be met with less risk um, when it's launched. Mm, yeah. That, that looking again, thinking about this longevity, right? That there is a multifaceted approach here of, I need to design something. I need to offer something that is going to have a lot of, of stickiness and that I can build on of whether that's adding additional services or serving them in different ways or linking new products into this, thinking of it holistically as a system that that really is a good correction to some of these ideas and things that we have of going, well, I, if, if it doesn't fit with this and the mission and the needs that we're serving, I'm I'm going to go ahead and put that in my little treasure chest over here, and and maybe there'll be a time where it comes out. So I'm 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 glad I thought of it. I'm glad I designed that, but it's not for it's not for right now. And that and knowing that that's that's okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It's great to have that store of uh, store of designs, and uh, and also too, it's meant that um, you know I I have a lot of different hardware, different kinds of materials in the workshop that aren't actually used in our product line. And that has come from, um, you know, all these years of thinking about different things and designing different things, but not releasing them. And it's really fantastic to have all those pieces around at hand to use when, yeah, I do set aside some creative time to, to make something new design. So yeah, it's never, none of it's in vain. (laughs) <laughs> well, so for for you in, in your business, you know, you've kind of walked us through a lot of of changes that you made. Do do you like to make little changes at a time, or are you more okay? Well, we're just going to make one big leap and see what happens. It's definitely both. Oh. Um, you know, for example, that big leap of opening the store, which the decision was made and executed within a few months. Um, that was definitely a big leap, and then every single day. Every single day I make small steps. Um, So, yeah, and I think that's really how I'm looking at my time with Tiny Horse now that I have Teresa working with me and um, taking a lot of uh, pressure off the production side for me. Um, You know, I'm starting to do... Uh, In the store now, I have in the basement a dedicated photography and video area, which is set up all the time, which is really nice. I couldn't do very many videos in my house, (laughs) Mm. (laughs) Um, in my small home, which is like I'm always angling out like my kitchen or my bed. (laughs) So so this is really great. And um, uh, so now I have a whole whack of videos that I want to make, but I am just doing knowing that. You know, every time I set up that camera and I do, I work on a topic, it's a contribution to the broader library of um, tutorials that I want to make. And, you know, I'm releasing them now just as like little reels or little um, individual posts. But eventually when I have a whole, um, a whole library of these things, I can bring them together in a video manual or or something like that. Or maybe at one point I can 
hire someone to help me with social media and they have all that knowledge about the product there. Um, so yeah, small steps every day, big steps when I'm randomly inspired. (laughs) Um, yeah. I I think it is, and I think it also probably depends on what what the thing is that you're working on, and what we work on in our business of going. Okay, does this need to be a big step of expanding a service area, hiring somebody? Maybe it's it's opening up a brick and mortar store. Those are those are just inherently big steps in what that decision is, versus the little by little. I'm going to make a little improvement here. I'm going to tighten this up over here. I'm going to learn this one more thing and just collectively continuing to move forward and really stepping back and going, what ne- what does this decision necessitate I do? Is this a small improvement area or am I going to have to jump in and really make this big step? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you know, what I've really discovered too is that all these small steps that you make every day support you in taking those big leaps. Mm-hmm. Um, so for example, when I made the decision to step down from walking dogs and take on tiny horse, time, uh, tiny horse full time, that was terrifying. That was the first really big decision that I made. To be honest, I needed a little bit of a break in general. And, um, in the summer 2021, I kind of did take that break, but sales kept coming in, even though I wasn't as present as I had been up to making that decision. Mm -hmm. And I felt like the work that I had done before to connect with people and get my message out there was carrying me through a time when I couldn't be as present. And, you know, I'm feeling that now too, with opening the business, Um, there is so much work to be done here that doesn't involve being engaged with customers. I mean, (laughs) after I get off the phone with you, I'm going to finish making this uh, iron pipe display thing with a wood shelf on top. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, so... There are a lot of things that I have to do in regards to opening the store that is taking away from me being present on social media, but still the sales have come in and have supported us during this time. And it's all those little steps that I took before to create reels and talk with people that are carrying me now. So, you know, both those things are so important. You said a phrase earlier of my time with Tiny Horse, and and I get a sense from you, Taylor, that you really view kind of Tiny Horse as a as a thing out both outside of you, but also inextricably linked to you. Is is that something that you've just always viewed it as, or have you developed really a a relationship with with your business and what it can be? Oh, this this like makes me tear up a little bit <laughs> with that question. That's so good. Um, yeah, I absolutely see Tiny Horse as its own entity. Um, I think that's really important because it helps keep my ego out of it in terms of I keep the focus on the products and um, their development is not about me personally. And that lets me be really open to people's feedback. And uh, yeah, so I think it's important in that regard. Um, but I actually, before Tiny Horse, um, this is not the first major project that I've taken on. Um, I started out working in the publishing industry in my early 20s, and I was really inspired by that. And I started a national poetry series in my hometown of Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And um, I hosted every week um, uh, emerging writers from the community. and then. Um, paid a well-known uh, poet from somewhere else in the country to come um, do a feature. And that was incredibly popular in my community. I ran that for three years and decided to move to Montreal to do my master's degree in art history. So um, it was such an institution in the city at that time that rather than um, dismantling it, I had um, you know, both provincial and national art funding for it. I found a new director and worked with him to take over the series. And that I launched that series in 2008, and it's still running today. And it's called Tonight is Poetry. <laughs> and uh, 
it has had a number of directors now. Um, and it just was my first big experience in creating something that I felt really passionate about, but had to keep a distance um, from myself personally to the point that I was able to, you know, walk away from it and um, just let it be its own thing. And yeah, so there's that. And then I, here in Toronto, very oddly, I was the director of a moth study <laughs> where we documented the population of moths in High Park. Um, and that kind of disbanded during the pandemic. But yeah, I've just always been a very community oriented person who sees the value in sort of bringing people together and, um, building things together based on a, a need in the community. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I've just sort of developed that over the long term in terms of seeing tiny horse as its own thing and, and not just its own thing, but sort of all of our thing, <laughs> um, you know, it's for me, it's for the dog walkers. And, um, I'm really grateful that I got to do it full time and that it can sustain, both myself and Teresa, um, in our day-to-day -day lives. I'm just super grateful for that. And if that's where it ends and we just get to kind of putz around and ship orders and make videos and things, I'm so fulfilled by that. Oh, m many of us struggle with that though, to have some sort of separation because we see our business as a reflection of us. We are personally invested in it. It's our baby we know that i hear that language a lot and and that we have such a, a close tie to our business that it, it's hard for us to step back and view it um you know with a critical eye or view it in a, a non personal way what what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's struggling with gaining some, some boundaries or some separation there i think and a lot of times one thing that sort of saved me from kind of falling into tiny horse and absorbing it as Taylor is trying to keep a personal life. Um, as I mentioned, like as I was running tiny horse, I was directing this moth study and that's completely outside of the dog world. And I think that helped me keep a sense of myself. Um, I've always loved insects and uh, having that hobby and placing time in that hobby and other things that I'm interested in, I guess, kind of help remind me that even though Tiny Horse is this wonderful thing and it is a reflection of me, it's not everything about me. Um, so maybe that, you know, maybe just being, <laughs> um, having hobbies and uh, allocute, all, all, allocating the time for them. And, and I think too, like, of course I could work from when I wake up to when I go to bed on tiny horse, but at one point you just have to say, I am not going to do everything today. And you have to put that work aside. And even if it's something simple, like, okay, I'm going to make a nice meal for myself rather than order in, just setting aside the time to chop food and like listen to a podcast about something not related to your work and cook that and, and eat it and feel fulfilled. I think that that's a really useful exercise in just creating some distance between your work and your personal life, body, soul, heart, all of that. So taking care of yourself. Yeah. Taking care of yourself and just knowing that there will be another day and more hours for the work that you need to get done to be done. And it'll never end. <laughs> never. <laughs> well, I, you, you said a phrase there, uh, at, at Taylor, of it, it, my business is a reflection of me, but it's not everything of me. And at mm -hmm. the end of the day, recognizing that we are so much more than what we do. And we have interests, we have hobbies, we have friends, we have family, we have significant others that are part of who we are as well, even more so than our business. And sometimes it takes shipping things off or offloading responsibilities or saying no so that we can go to moth studies or set up, uh, you know, go to coffee with friends or whatever that means so that we can have ourselves. 
And that, that when we recognize it doesn't, you know, my business is going to run, I'm going to run it well, I'm going to steward it well. But if I'm not taking care of myself, then we're going to have some really big issues that are going to come up down the line. Yes, exactly. And yeah, it's really about that sustainability, right? Sustainability yeah. of uh, how you create and direct your life. And, you know, for people who um, have that autonomy and people who have that freedom to design their own activities from day to day, we have a lot of control over how we operate things. And yeah, it's, it's hard to, I mean, it's easy to feel like swept away by the things that need to be done rather than feel like you're the director of what needs to be done. Right. Well, Taylor, I want to thank you so much for coming back on the show today and walking us through how we can better take care of ourselves, uh, what process improvement really looks like in ourselves and staying focused and avoiding that mission creep. Uh, I know that, you know, hopefully people are interested in, in checking out your, your products and learning more about Tiny Horse. Uh, so how can people check out Tiny Horse and, and follow along with everything that you've got going on? Okay. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. It's so great to be on here. And I really appreciate what you're doing, uh, creating some conversations in the, the dog industry. Um, we are online at tinyhorse.ca. Uh, you can email me at hello at tinyhorse.ca. And we are on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. So lots of ways to reach out and see our products, see those tutorials we talked about. Oh, and, you know, I'm also trying to put more on YouTube now as well. So oh. just just Google us and see what comes up. <laughs> Taylor, as always, uh, it's such an immense ple- pleasure and honor to have you in your time today. So thank you so much. Thank you too, Colin. So how do you get better over time? Well, in a simplistic approach, you try new things. And you do that by getting feedback from either customers or yourself. And I love Taylor's mindset around this, where she views her business as both outside of who she is, apart from her, but also a part of her. This helps you be objective about your business to make those tough decisions and recognize that these things that you are trying aren't necessarily a reflection of who you are as a person. And that way we can grow and adapt much quicker and respond in better ways than if we view it as personal attacks against us if something isn't working out in our business. After the interview, we reached out and Tiny Horse is wanting to give you 10% off of a purchase of the products from her store. So you can go to tinyhorse.ca, watch all those helpful videos, and reach out to her if you have additional questions. But when you're ready to check out, use the code CONFESSIONAL10, all caps, just enter that CONFESSIONAL10, you'll get 10% off your purchase from Tiny Horse. Uh, she did not pay us to say this, Megan and I use these leashes in our business, and we absolutely Love them. So give them a try today. We want to thank today's sponsors of the show, Time to Pet and Pet Perennials, as well as thank you so much for listening. We can't tell you how much it means to us. We hope you're doing well. And if there's anything that we can do, support topics you want cover or people you'd like to see interviewed, including yourself, let us know. Feedback at PetsitterConfessional.com. We'll talk to you again soon. I'm <laughs> sorry.